are here with Nindo McKay. She is a Kenyan director, animator, and editor. And um, she has a, a wonderful new um, animated movie called Yellow Fever, which we will be discussing tonight. Um, hello, and thank you so much, Nindo, for coming on to The Crystal Show. Hey, Crystal. Hey. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. Uh, well, I want to ask you first, at what point did you decide that you wanted to be an animator? Uh, I was studying illustration at the Rhode Island School of Design, and um, you're required to take courses outside of your major to you know, have a well-rounded background. Mm -hmm. And I took a film course, and... I couldn't return back to illustration. There was this thing when you suddenly have this element of time and you're playing with time and you're counting frames and you're, you know, exposing um, film and finding this this stuff that you've created coming back to you a week later and it was just so exciting. So I found a way to switch into film animation and video. Um, so I wanted to play with time. Yeah. All right. Um, now, a lot of us don't know a lot about animation, although we watch it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the actuality of animation uh, can be a little foreign to a lot of people. So can you tell us a little bit about the process of animation and at least uh, of what you do? Okay, so the type of animation I do is quite mixed media. There's um, the basic idea of animation is that you have a series of images and they play quickly and the eye gets tricked so that it doesn't see that there are gaps in between the different pictures mm. and it sees that there's actual um, life happening before it. Um, when I'm working with animation, I'm doing photography, I'm doing uh, hand-drawn animation, I'm scanning in objects, I'm doing stuff with charcoal. So uh, my animation is sort of a trial and error based process <laughs> and um, it depends on the content that I'm trying to work with. So some things will work with uh, hand drawn like uh, charcoal animation and other stuff is just not going to work with that. It needs something to do with photography or to do it like layering a lot of images together. So it depends. Okay. Now, you've created a powerful film called Yellow Fever, which Thanks. delves into the controversial yet increasingly popular lightening of the skin. Now, I have seen documentaries regarding women from India and other places dealing with the same issues uh, because of the caste systems there uh, that is based on having lighter skin. What led you to create such a film as this? I think there are two sort of things that stimulated me. Uh, I was working on my thesis and I was looking at the historical representation of people who are called indigenous mm. um, in ethnographic film and photography. And I was questioning how these um, historical representations have affected the way that we look at ourselves. And then I started asking myself, well, what about modern media? How has that changed since? And that's when I started to actually take into, like, to see very uh, certain images of African or indigenous people and maintaining us in this weird sort of stasis. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm just in the car with my niece and we're hanging out and she keeps talking about some cute boy in her class and it's like, this boy this, this boy that. And then... I realized everything she was mentioning related to him being half American because I think his dad is the one who's um is white. Okay. So it reminded me of the way we were when we were growing up when you know anyone who was a bit like caramel toned was suddenly really attractive. He didn't have any other attributes other than being caramel skin toned and that was enough to you know, you could be whatever you wanted to be. You were like the most desirable thing based on that element. Um, and I realized my niece is also absorbing this information like 20 years after we finished our own educate, like uh, primary school. So I was wondering how does this affect her because she's very deep. She has a really deep skin tone. And that's how I ended up uh, interviewing her for my film. 
Yeah, she had some um, inside of the film itself. It was uh, really interesting to see and poignant to see the fact that she was such a young age and how mm -hmm. this affects, because, um, you know, these are our formative years, you know, mm -hmm. from five age and, and, and on, and how this affects how we choose mates later on in life, how we look at ourselves, and how we then present ourselves yes. to the world. Yes, yeah, it's, it's embedded in us from a really early age. It's, I, I don't know how you unlearn those things, I think they're like within our blood. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. Yeah, how do we unlearn it? And because uh, some of the, you know, the things that we talk about regarding colorism, regarding um, being uh, black, African-American, um, other women of color, how do we unlearn the fact of what is beautiful? And, um, and I know we have so many people who, you know, tell us, well, you're beautiful no matter what. You're beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've heard phrases such as, you're beautiful even though you're dark. <laughs> or, yeah. You know, and yeah, how, how in the world can a, a child and then an adult female unlearn those types of, of stigmas this is really good that you've brought up this um like saying you're beautiful even though you're dark because um i don't know if you've you've heard about dr yabba blaze um a website on facebook she has a pretty period website which is pretty as in full stop don't say i'm pretty for a dark girl don't say i'm pretty even though i'm dark i'm just pretty full stop and she wants people to learn to appreciate that and she's celebrating different women of different skin tones um and you know people are submitting their photographs and talking about their experiences growing up uh, sort of like a supportive group a supportive environment where you can celebrate women of different skin tones i think even someone uh, such as lupita nyongo even you know she had her, she came into the spotlight really fast. Yeah. And suddenly, if you look like Lupita, you are attractive. Um, it, you know, before that, it was, um, you know, even in Kenya, people were not really paying attention to Lupita until she came into stardom. And that also affects many young women who are growing up because, you know, here's someone else who's being celebrated who is who has a deep skin tone and she's being called attractive. You need to see more people with more variations, you know, to combat this issue. Right. It's, it's like a validation is to say, yeah. you know, you look this way, therefore you are beautiful as well. And mm -hmm. um, in the media, uh, we don't see that. I know here in America, we see as African-American women, first it was about you know, celebrating your blackness, celebrating your heritage, and um, that was okay, and just being black, period, was okay. But then we saw a lot of the, the transformation into women of color being, well, if you're Latino or if you're exotic, which meant mm -hmm. you're not black you are an islander or but basically you're lighter skinned with you know wavy hair so this kind of outset you know the women of african-american culture to say okay well we're not are we, are we not exotic are we not beautiful now even though i thought we were i guess we're not yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and we see that in the videos um because it is a choice of those um entertainment icons who decide okay i'm gonna choose these type of women mm -hmm. to represent mm -hmm. my love interest and usually the, no they're not black they are mixed or other mm -hmm. types of women of color well there's the issue is that when you have so much repetition of the same image then you start to feel that anything that is in that image isn't going to work you know we can't have a dark-skinned deep-toned woman in the film because it's just not going to work so let's have a really pale um african-american or black american actress be the lead role um if you keep repeating these these ideas then they become embedded in the people who are absorbing them it's the same thing as saying that you know only men can do certain jobs you right. repeat it from the time people are young and they accept it 
you know, oh, black people behave this way. You repeat it enough, enough times when people expect that that's how they should behave and they wonder why you, if you are black, are not behaving the same way. Well, it's that repetition. That's true. That's very true. What do we covet every day? We covet what we see. And um, uh, this was a question that was asked by one of our listeners um, from the St. Louis area, a black woman in St. Louis. And she asked, we as African Americans feel or have heard that Africans don't accept us because we are mutts, quote unquote, and not of pure blood, etc. That being said, does the skin lightning play into that proudness to be African? I don't know. The first, the first part is is is, is too deep. <laughs> I don't even know what to do. The first yeah. part of the question. So okay, so all Africans, yeah, don't accept all African or Black Americans because they are mixed with other people. Yeah. Is this the first? Okay, that's just weird because even we're mixed in different ways. So mm-hmm. uh, can. I mean, that's coming from, maybe she's had some bad experiences with people. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the entire continent. Right. Um, I can speak on my behalf. I haven't ever rejected uh, an African or black American. See, I'm even saying both because sometimes I meet people who want one and sometimes I meet people who want the other. Mm -hmm. See, I'm being inclusive here. So obviously I haven't rejected um, anyone for being a mutt um, and I don't believe in people being mutts. But what was the second part? You see, I just got so stunned by that part. I forgot it. <laughs> the second, how does this play into being proud? Um, yeah, proud of the, yeah, the, the, also, yeah, the speak into the skin lightning. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the thing is that while you people like within the U.S. Are, and in some of the diaspora are dealing with issues related to um, historical slavery, those sort of issues, we're still dealing with issues related to colonialism. Mm-hmm. So, um People, uh, everyone is claiming to be proud of whoever they are, but there are also these other elements which are um, in the media that are subconsciously eating at you. And that's why I was calling the film Yellow Fever, because um, there is a song by Fela Kuti that was done in the, was it the 60s? Hmm. Um, And he was, he sang the song called Yellow Fever, and he was really attacking Nigerian women for um, bleaching their skin. The song is so aggressive. So I was calling my film the same name, but not in the same sort of antagonistic approach. I'm seeing it more as a as a condition. You know, you have right. women dealing with bulimia and anorexia because they have all this information coming from media about being a size zero, which shouldn't even exist as a number. As I mean, you shouldn't be able to say I wear a size zero. Um, And people have accepted that this is a condition. If you're starving yourself or you're trying to make yourself throw up all the food you ate, you're dealing with something psychological. I feel that um, women who are bleaching themselves, who are accepting to put in all these like poisonous chemicals onto their skin and to take these strange pills that they don't understand, are dealing with a psychological issue. So you might be proud of who you are, but if you're dealing with something that's so deeply seated in your psychology and in the psychology of your society, you're going to be dealing with a lot of pressure that's making you do what is essentially counteractive to being proud of your own heritage. Yeah, exactly. Now, what do you uh, hope that people take away from your film, Yellow Fever, and some of your other works? Um, well, you know, it's sort of... I was making that film in a therapeutic way. Okay. Like I deal with, with a lot of uh, personal issues um, and things that I'm seeing around me through my films. Mm. So I really struggled to make that film. Even the interview I did with my niece was really difficult to edit because I had to listen to her saying these things again and again while I was working on the film. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, and it made me realize I have to tell her there's some there's another element there's media telling her repeatedly that she's unattractive because of her skin tone i wanted to ask you another question regarding your niece um Mm -hmm. can you if you you wouldn't mind pointing out some of the things that stood out to you 
that she said um, during your interview with her, whether it made it to the film or not? Um, I think the parts that were most um, poignant and relevant and were able to share the message as directly as possible um, from her interview is what I included in the film. Okay. Um, there was some, I remember her saying that when she preferred to have her hair braided, like with really long braids, because when she swam, she enjoyed how it felt because it floats. Mm. Um, and her own hair doesn't float. And they just, I mean, there, there are some, you know, I'm never going to say that women should never wear weaves or never bleach your skin I, you know something like skin bleaching I think you, you shouldn't but it's your own choice but there's some like other enjoyments of just being a woman you know that she said she likes it when her hair floats um, there's just some things like as a woman that you can enjoy and whatever gender you want to enjoy as well um, and if you want to have a long weave and you enjoy how it blows in the wind I think that's great I think the only thing is that when people believe this is the only way they can feel attractive and be whole, then that's when there's an issue. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So can you tell us about some of your other films and maybe some of your upcoming projects that you're working on? Okay, so I have two upcoming projects, and they are so upcoming it's starting to make me go a bit crazy. <laughs> so, um, one film is called Birika. And uh, it's uh, visualizing what Nairobi would be like if all of our strong emotions had a visual element to them. So this lady goes on a date and um, she's, being, she's in love with her date. And uh, while, as he speaks to her, his words pour out, of her pour out of his mouth and onto her skin and little flowers start to bloom and she starts mm. to glow because this is, you know, showing her experience of Nairobi at that moment mm -hmm. when she's in traffic and some nasty guy is trying to hit on her he sees her his cigarette she sees his cigarette smoke as like green dark gas coming out of his mouth and wriggling itself into her hair mm -hmm. um so it's live action it's shot with actors and actresses and then um we're doing the post-production to put the animation into it. So um, that's Birika. And then my other film is called My Normal Kenyan Family because my family is not that normal. And <laughs> it's paralleling the history of Kenya with the personal experiences my family has had during like really intense political moments in our country. So, so one's documentary animation, the other one's fiction. Okay. Well, I would say that definitely um, the movie Yellow Fever, which you can see on um, Nindo's website, and um, is definitely Oscar worthy. I mean, it was it was um, powerful, and it has spoken to so many different people. And um, have you had like outreaches from others who have commented on um, the film and how it touched them? I've had emails and people have written on the film page on Vimeo. Um, I've had people talk to me on on Facebook. And just last month, actually in February, I was at Design in Daba in Cape Town in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I played the film. And people came, I, you know, I played the film and I had to talk about um, the representation of um, indigenous people. And... You know, people came and gave me hugs throughout the day afterwards. You know, they were so moved. They just came up to me and started hugging me and saying thank you so much for having made the film and for the presentation. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's quite nice when you're just doing something for your homework and then you realize that <laughs> people, people really enjoy it. And oh. they mean to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, did I hear or see that um, Solange actually reached out to yeah. you and said hello? Yeah. <laughs> About the Twitter, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I think actually she really boosted my views after that. It was like My views went crazy after Solange talked about it. 
Yeah. Yeah, little things like that. But you know, she is uh she's very powerful and she she definitely has uh the look of mm-hmm. yeah. um of, of a woman who is uh a natural and mm-hmm. um sporting that type of imagery which is important, you know. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I was excited about that. Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I want you to tell our audience how can they find you and where can they find you on the web to watch your films. Okay, so my website is thenge.com, which is the and then N-G-E dot com. Um, my Vimeo page is, you just look for Ngendo, N-G-E-N-D-O. You see, the problem is my name is not common there, so it's not even going to make sense. Well, that's okay. We'll have links to it. <laughs> to, to, to click because it's not gonna. It's not even gonna help. <laughs> but thenear.com is my website, and and yeah, if you search my last name, you'll find me. Also, it's very uncommon. Well, yeah. yeah, right. See, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Yeah. M U K I I. Yeah. <laughs> Very uncommon. Even in Nairobi, it's very uncommon. So there you go. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nindo, for coming on to The Crystal Show. We really appreciate you taking out the time to speak with us regarding your fabulous video and film, uh, Yellow Fever. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, yeah, I really appreciate you talking with me about it. Yeah. Well, you know, it like I said, it spoke to me and like it spoke to so many different uh, women of color. And um, we hope to hear more great things from you and we hope to see more of this documentary. Thanks so much. Thanks for your support. <laughs>